Jack slid the frosty mug right to her down the bar, a Sierra Nevada, the usual. He was good at skee ball too, among his other talents. Well, Cass, he said, you've done it again. Done what? she answered, then took a couple of swallows, but that wasn't how they really talked. It was for times they were alone in the dimness of the silver stake, like now, when Jack had just opened up and Cass was in town to check her P.O. box. A few years back, she'd even had a fling with him before he took up with the Native American gal over in Lee, and the goofy redneck banter was from then. Got yourself another admirer, he said, flaring his eyebrows. He had a sharp jaw, a cleft chin, and slicked back dark hair. You mean Glamour Boy from Elko? He been here? Not your car dealer guy. I'm talking something special. Jamie Flagg. Jack smiled at the pained expression she threw him and moved closer in that slow, loose-boned way he had, planting his elbows on the wooden surface. Christ, she said. You're kidding. Jamie Flagg was nearly old enough to be her father, not to mention being a combination of Lamoille's town weirdo and town drunk. Cass, 39, wore a sandy blonde ponytail and kept herself in decent shape but you'd never catch her in a skirt. She drove an old ragtop jeep named Dusty Jose and lived in jeans, day or night. Sorry, Jack said, feigning sympathy. You know how people pour their hearts out in here, if they're not too drunk to talk, she said. He took the bar towel and eased away again around the jukebox where he made a show of polishing the chrome. Jamie says you flirted with him. Jack added, back over his shoulder, came to the lookout for a visit. That was no visit, she said. Place wasn't open yet, but he showed up anyway. Well, he's gone all Patsy Cline over it, Jack said, still polishing. Then he crooned, you walk by and I fall to pieces. Please, you just ruined my beer. <laughs> Except he had a nice voice and from tending bar knew the words to a hundred cheesy love songs, especially Ray Price, George Jones, and those guys. Probably sang them in the ear of his new gal in bed, like he used to with her. But when Cass took her last sip and stood up, Jack had more to say again from behind the bar. Word to the wise, though, Cass. He claims that driving in and out of town, he spied you in the ranch meadow, sunbathing, and I know how, how you like being tan all over. Oh shit, she said. You can't see down there from the road. He says you can, Jack shrugged, thinking of his lookout job, has to have good eyes. Typically, Cass got on fine with men, as lovers or as friends, sometimes better than with women. But she didn't really need a guy in her life. Her attitude was, been there, done that, and as for Jamie Flagg, forget it. If she had an itch she couldn't scratch, there'd always be cat. There'd always been candidates, though it seemed like fewer lately, not that she minded being alone. Which was why she jumped at the chance to caretake Juniper Ranch that summer, and leaving the silver stake behind, Dusty Jose was hauling her back out there in the July heat, true to his name by kicking up tall billows of picking up tall billows of it on Toya B Forest 640, winding into the Ruby Mountains that stood like a wall east and south of tiny Lamoille. Heavily forested, too, once you got high enough, with trout streams, snow banks into August, and peaks topping 11,000 feet. Last thing you'd expect in central Nevada, but they were glorious. Burl Watson, who owned half the Lamoille Valley and a bunch else, didn't run the ranch for cattle anymore. It was his hunting lodge, or whatever, a retreat from the Watson family spread down in the flats. Could be he also saw it as a future ski area or subdivision. He had a sharp business eye, and not just for livestock, but mining, real estate, and timber, every card in the deck. So when his wife cajoled him into three months in Europe, and he offered the place to Cass with a small stipend, if she fed the horses and watered the meadow, she was ready to lock her trailer two blocks from Main Street and try something different. This next stretch of road had crosswise ribs of granite that bucked her jeep side to side, but she was out of the sagebrush and the worst of the dust now, running along the creek under sugar pines and ponderosas, 
where a marker said two miles to the ranch turnoff. And Burl must have known on the grapevine that she had ranching in her background and had come from Montana. True, as far as it went, but she doubted that he or the car dealer or Jack, let alone her friend Marley, the head rancher's wife, would have anything to do with her if they knew the rest. Okay, Jack might. That gal of his in a rage last winter had shot holes in their front door and he bailed her out of the slammer anyway. Because growing up, Cass had hated her parents' wacko religion, had run away penniless at 18 to be a showgirl in Vegas, but first had worked under the name Rose at the brothels in Winnemucca and Gerlach, saving cash for the big city. Good thing she had, too. No harm involved and no diseases, but she learned a lot about life, about men, and Vegas could be a tough town if you arrived broke. She'd actually snagged a few minor chorus line gigs, but mainly served drinks or dealt cards in the casinos, even after she and Don, also a dealer, got themselves married for eight years. By then, she'd been planning to dump him for playing around, but he ended up dead in a car wreck and left her their little condo and a decent chunk of insurance money. So with the idea of drifting north again, she padded her savings by signing on at a high-end escort service before testing her map and her luck in Lamoille, which seemed her best move ever. Cost of living was low, the big cottonwoods and willows framed against the vistas of mesquite, alfalfa, and sage had made her feel at home from day one, and she could reliably earn extra cash by cleaning motel rooms or staffing the desk. At the Juniper Ranch sign, she swung onto the rutted access road, but the sign's other arrow, fire lookout, six miles, brought her back to Jamie Flagg. What the hell had she done to touch him off, except being female? In May, having agreed to occupy the ranch after Memorial Day, she'd gone there one afternoon to check things over. She'd been thrilled at what she found, too and afterward headed up Mount Fitzgerald for an intro to the view everybody raved about. Sure, she knew Jamie was the regular summertime spotter and had been for years, pretty much a miracle too, that he could be dodgering drunk at the silver stake all the time or on the bench in front of the feed store, yet was nothing but diligent, sober, and responsible for his three or four months on duty. Where he got cash for all those drinks, nobody could figure either but he worked at the mostly played out gold mines in eastern Oregon before showing up in Lamoille and renting a dumpy shack, and the rumor was that he'd done a little high grading and had nuggets and dust hidden somewhere that he sold on the QT in Reno. He also had a reputation as a perv, and her divorced friend, Annabelle, who ran their hair salon, called the sheriff on him for hanging around outside her house after she told him to stop. First, he started coming in for haircuts. She did men and women both. Then had talked about how she was better looking than those models in Playboy and how he liked to imagine her that way. And next thing, there he was, waving through her side windows at home. No one could prove, he, no one could prove he'd been in her yard and not on the public street, so no charges were filed. As the story goes, as the story went, he'd left Oregon after tricking a teenage girl into his car and trying to take her to a motel. But true or not, he wasn't supposed to be at the lookout then. It stayed closed till June, and when Cass got there, she could see why. 200 yards from the top dusty ho Jose ran smack against a crusted football field-sized snowdrift on the Jeep track maybe nine feet deep, that stopped her flat. So she walked the rest of the way, in sparse to non-existent tree cover, sliding and falling on her butt a couple of times, but the view from the rocky outcrop she reached was killer. Elko and Highway 80, like some kind of toy train outfit 30 miles to the north, salt flats and desert east and west, and all around to the south, three or four other snowy peaks set onto deeply carved, velvety slopes of pine that spread and spread. It was cold, too, even in full sun, colder than a fleece vest could handle, and she wrapped her arms around her chest but couldn't tear herself away, which was when Jamie's voice came out of nowhere. View up here don't quit, does it? 
he said, crunching along the edge of the snow with the stone and steel lookout tower, windows all boarded shut for winter, looming above him like something in a prison camp movie. Jesus! She dumped about off her feet. Scared the crap out of me. No worries. I needed to know if storms might have wrecked the place. Saw your jeep and thought having company would be nice. Nice for who, she wondered. Except he hadn't been drinking, because when he did, his cheeks puffed out and he'd just sit sluggish, hardly saying a word, like reversed shyness. Since booze loosened up most guys, but in the red light trade, she'd seen it before. Some customers would roll in Hale and Hardy by themselves and her a drink, yet in private be so nervous and shamefaced they could scarcely go through the motions. But that day's version of Jamie had an alert stance, and beneath the billed cap, his broad, pale face bordered on healthy pink. Even so, handsome, he'd never be. Not with the clownish nose and those pointy blue eyes set way too close to be proportional. His mother was Basque, they said, which supposedly explained his coloring. But who would blame you for the short-legged, blocky body, the adolescent squeak in his voice, and the oddball way his feet kicked forward when he walked? Ungainly was the truth of it, including his everyday wardrobe of raggedy Carhartt overalls. And somehow, which he never seemed aware of, he made the people around him feel ungainly, too. In a couple of months, he said, ignoring the lack of response from Cass, all under where the snow is will be wildflowers, columbine, primrose, three or four kinds of lupine, balsam daisies, paintbrush, mountain spray, you name it. Something to see, I'll tell you. Must be beautiful, she said grudgingly. He came closer, standing beside her now. I hear you've been babysitting over Burl's place. Start next month she said, without looking at him. But word sure got around quick, her ponytail hanging from the vent of a cap much like his, brushed against her neck in the breeze. He has lots of flowers in that meadow already, and I really love them. Not like these up here, he said. But once I start my job, I get days off every few weeks and pass right by. Only road there is she said, unsure of his implication. She also felt him examining her like an exotic species. So to cut that off, she sidestepped and locked eyes with his. He showed a smile with his crooked teeth. In the little box, he said, waving his hand as if it held a magic wand. I get wild onions, too. Well, use those for turkey stuffing, she said firmly, <coughs> hoping to end the conversation. I saw a big flock of Rio Grande's Toms and hens on the road coming, and then she turned and walked away. Saw that myself, he said, his squeaky voice getting quieter. Except I can't eat them. Well, they're good. You hunt, right? Since he wasn't giving up, she faced him again. Not them, he said, still quiet. I've made my peace with turkeys. He craned his head around with exaggerated care like he feared being overheard or possibly punished. Years ago, he went on, my mom raised him, and she used to, Cass laughed, in recognition of her own family's chicken coop, but also at his ludicrous unease. Oh, she said, the bloody hatchet. He looked offended. No, he went on, my mom done that part. She'd had my big brother and me chase down a nice fat one. Then he would hold it, and I had to tie a length of twine on its neck. We'd lead and shove the thing to where she kept his thick box, and she'd put the open side down over it. My brother sat on the box, and she made me yank on the string and step backward to stretch the head out under the edge, flat on the dirt. His voice was nearly a whisper now. Poor helpless thing could only see me with one scared eye all creepy-like, till our mom brought down the axe and Red spurred it out. Best way I know to do it, she always said. Head down, he left Cass with the silence of where they were, which felt about total, save for the breeze. And his story was sickening. She'd give him that. First time telling anyone, he added, and drew a long breath. 
Briefly, she had a new vision of Jamie, that the boy he'd been back then looked almost how he looked now, an overgrown boy, or worse for him, a lost boy, lost in a man's world. Guess I'll head into town, she said, sorry she'd stayed as long as she had. Okay, he said, seeming distraught. She moved back toward the snow, but after a few steps, he partly followed. Tell you one thing, <laughs> I'm probably too old for you, but make me even five years younger, and the whole way you'd stop my attentions is with a restraining order. <laughs> she felt a stab of alarm, but he winked, like he'd just told a joke, so she replied in kind. No, not sure I need one, she said. He had to know she owned a 20-gauge shotgun, could use it, and was famous at the Silver State for bagging her limit of sage kraus every season when plenty of the local men came up short. I'm pretty tough. She hopped up on the drip and walked off as rapidly as the footing would allow, worried that he'd keep following, but he didn't. And just below, alongside her jeep, was his truck, a battered brown Dodge 4X4, with one of its quarter panels a mismatch green and the rest so smeared with Bondo that gray made a third color. But damn, she realized now, sitting at the table in the ranch kitchen sorting through the mail she'd just picked up in town, the key point was her joking reply to the restraining order thing. He was so clueless, he took it as a come on, not that she needed protection. Summer was half over, and she hadn't laid eyes on him since being on the mountain, and if he showed up here, she'd put him in his place so fast he'd forget his own name. What bugged her was his I spy routine, because she almost remembered that after dropping 4,000 feet from her trip to the lookout that day, and coming around the nose of the ridge above the creek, She'd known Jupiter Ranch was right below, down through the dense trees and brush somewhere, but the road had gotten narrow and tricky just then, with tilted shells of exposed rock, and she had to focus on that. So damn again. Well, maybe you could see a slice of the meadow, even if she'd never seen the road, heard it sometimes off in the distance, but not seen it. Or was this just Jack bullshitting, or Jamie blowing smoke for whoever was in earshot? Good chance, but the fact was, she valued her privacy and did like it all over town, and no one had a right to violate that. Or what if Jamie could see her from the tower? Hmm. Outside, she stepped off the porch to scan the ridge line. The tower was way beyond that, with not one blip of the damn thing poking up anywhere, and the meadow was more sheltered yet. Still, the idea of being intruded on almost pissed her off enough to grab the shotgun and drive there to confront him. Especially since the ranch was the nicest place she'd ever lived, period. The pump house, the split rail fence, the stable and the barn were all original, set in a lush box canyon laced with ditches for irrigation. Only the main house was new, one of those custom-built cedar log places, a story and a half with vaulted ceilings, multiple skylights and oversized windows, custom furnishings inside too, rough hewn tables and chairs, pottery and baskets, Navajo rugs and a natural stone hearth, pretty much heaven by her standards, and to top it off, horses she could ride. Further mulling the situation, she went back inside, poured a glass of wine and fixed some eggs with chorizo and a salad for supper. Later on, she tended the hay in the stable and adjusted the flow in the ditches as the moon rose to unseen choir of coyotes. Then, no hardship involved, she'd taken herself upstairs to read. Cass was big on books and had been since her first county library in Montana. You were never bored and always learning, but the next morning, Having put Jamie Flagg out of her mind, she woke up with an answer. To hell with him! She was doing whatever she wanted in that meadow, and if that pathetic old lost boy purr stole an eyeful through some secret peephole, he could have one. And if he blabbed in town, so what? The following week, high summer, the weather was as sweet as it knew how to be, and Cass spent every afternoon in the meadow where the last wildflowers, tired-looking clovers, mule ears, and penstemons still hung on in isolated patches. She used sunscreen, of course, but had long since turned golden bronze and felt great. 
She could easily live on what Burl was paying, too. So however sinful her leisure, it wouldn't touch a dime of her savings. She had also started a really good book, nice and long, called Angel of Repose, that pulled her right in. With Friday's lunch out of the way, she cooled off by standing knee-deep in the icy ditch water for a minute, flopped onto a blanket ready for a new chapter, and eventually dozed off until a hellacious noise snatched her back awake and she sat up in one motion, panicked to see a dust plume coursing straight in the air across the wooded slope. Rock slide? No, too metallic. A mobile hollow banging, now gone so quiet even the bird calls had stopped. Same as with that train derailment she'd heard as a kid. On her blanket, naked and dumbfounded, Cass could only stare at the equally motionless plume, barely able to breathe. Holy shit, the car had just gone off the road. She grabbed the beach robe and ratty tennis shoes she'd worn coming from the house, threw them on and stood as her pulse amped to roar in the continuing quiet. But wouldn't passengers or the driver be screaming for help? Unless, Christ, the ranch had zero phone service and for emergencies, just the short wave Burl's taught her to use. Except a rescue team would take forever and Cass did no CPR. Lurching forward, she raced across the meadow hopping ditches and plunging into the brush. It was steep, rocky, and miserable. The maze of low branches tearing at her robe and hair and her breath sounding in her ears. Up she went, zigzagging where she had to with only the lessening plume to navigate by. As she got higher, the trees were bigger and her route opened up a bit. I'm coming, she shouted, sweat running down her neck. Yell to help me find you, no answer. Then above, she saw where a big tree limb had newly snapped off and steered toward that clamoring through boulders, slippery with fallen pine needles. And in a shallow bowl, something flashed, like a chrome or glass. So she fought her way to, to Jamie's truck? Jamie, she called. You okay? Still no answer. But he might end up with a new story for the silver stake, since she'd do mouth to mouth for sure if he needed it. She really wanted him to be alive. That made no sense, but she did. The truck itself had swan dived cab first into the base of a rock slab as big as her trailer and was lodged with the bed counted up 60 degrees. The windshield they sh shattered all over, but she could only see in by squatting from the open passenger window closest to her a double arm load of flowers, yellow, pink, red, purple, and spewed out on the ground, accompanied by a sign made from the flap of a cardboard box that her eyes decoded instantly, even though it was upside down. For Cass, it read, in smudged marker ink. Everything happened so fast, she hadn't felt herself tear up. And only when sparkling drips slid from her jaw did she realize she was crying. Her head and spine kept slumping forward, and Without the force to speak, her lips mouthed, Oh, Jamie, you poor fool. Because she had suddenly seen him on the other side of the cab, slid toward her beneath the steering wheel, blood running from his ears and mouth, and with his neck elongated by the impact, caught at the chin in the V of the truck shoulder and lap belts, one of his eyes open and glazed stared straight at her, through her, past her, like she wasn't even there. Thank you.